was a great crowd. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we're really excited for our featured reader and also for our wonderful open mic readers. I um, want to thank Star Colebrook, who is our Logan City Poet Laureate in the back here. Yes. Yeah. Um, Star is the organizer of Helicon West and this is going strong obviously after a really long time and we're really excited to continue to have our great community come out um, to support these wonderful writers in our uh, community and from beyond the community. Um, thanks to uh, Logan City Library and thank you to um, all the different people who help out with Helicon West. We've got Wes here who's recording this event. If um, you do not want to be recorded, just tell him that you would like him to turn it off um, during the recording. Otherwise, everything's posted up on YouTube for us. Um, thank you to the Utah Humanities Book Festival. This is part of the, Huma the Utah Humanities Book Festival. I've read this so many times, my tongue might triple grip. <laughs> this annual free festival is the Utah Humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. The complete program is available at utahumanities.org. It goes through the entire month of October every year and covers um, all of Utah. There are events all over um, the state. And so keep your eyes open every October for just all these wonderful writers that come through. Our thanks to the Book Festival's major sponsors, the George S. and Dolores Dorr Eccles Foundation, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight we're going to start off with three open mic readers because we have some people that I would love we need to hear. And um, some people have to catch the bus, which doesn't run as late sometimes as we do. And so um, we'll start off with our first three open mic readers and then we'll move into our featured reader with, who I will introduce a little in a little bit. So um, our first readers will be Isaac Tim, Aaron Tim, and Brock DeChair. All right. day she died for Jeanette. Her things are up for grabs in the common room, not her wedding dress, heirlooms, or books of French poetry, but her every day, her paper towels, mixing bowls, food whittled down by diabetes to a few gluten-free boxes of pasta. They left her puzzles that she with deft hands fitted on restless nights, hands that crafted Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners that left her Mormon peers envious, her hands that fed babies, stitched her husband's uniform, paged through a French to English dictionary to translate Gunsmoke and Mr. Ed, her family treasures they preserve, enshrine on mantles, on jewelry boxes, wrap in hope chests for children who saw her saw their great-grandmother on her last birthday, but her neatly stacked puzzles remain, as do her darning needles and her yarn, five years forgotten. She wouldn't approve of me weeping over a box of salt-free crackers. For her tears, for life's sorrows were overspent. She saved hers for movies. Death, death froze her things that passed through her hands as if she would come back into the room for them, ask my help to load them back into her apartment, but it's no longer a home. It is now a space to be carpet cleaned, repainted, repopulated in a month. I think of all those aisles and secondhand stores, how many battered objects were handled by the nameless dead. I want to rescue them, rush out the doors, a deranged one-man band dropping pots and pans onto the parking lot, hoard them, divine the hands and names that passed over them daily. How small will my pile be? Broken pencils, empty notebooks, mismatched dice, 
from Dungeons and Dragons, things that passed my days and nights, blankets that covered my knees, the chair I set in the bathtub, what part of me will be enshrined on dead shelves? prayer. Don't kill yourself over heartbreak. This was her first admonishment. For ghosts are denied carnal pleasures. Don't fret over dying, for then a revenant you will be, killing our family enemies, never running out of ammunition. Juan sips bitter liquor. His abuela cleans her guns. Fear nothing, mijo, and nothing will claim you. Eat well, drink often, run red lights at 3 a.m., pray to the saints of Mary Jane and her white horse. Always light a candle at roadside chapels. Do this and you will always come home. Do this and your sons will grow strong. Thank you. This is a poem in praise of an underappreciated uh, public servant. Um, it's called Lament of the Dog Shit Bag Fairy. <laughs> and all the facts in here are, are true. Um, each, if each of the Earth's 900 million dogs shits a quarter pounder every day, nature must process three million fresh tons monthly, ever more of it in bags left trail side, trail side for some imaginary do-gooder, me. My colleagues have it easy. Babylon's Shedbet Hakisi wields epilepsy, strokes, sudden falls to protect privies from lusty lovers who have no sense of the sacred. In China, Zigu Shen defends concubines as well as latrines, pestering jealous wives with arrows. Like me, goddess Cloacina is in byproducts collection and transport, but her shit is big. Rome's main sewer, Cloaca Maxima, no big for me, no sex, no gratitude, just endless complaints about mutt mitts, shit sacks, doggy do bags I haven't yet collected, used by owners as gloves to clutch squishy warmth, not in an abandoned, forgotten. Don't worry, the fairy will get it. The bags blend green and brown, eco-friendly, biodegradable, protecting the uncurious from seeing, smelling, and heaven forfend, feeling their contents. They contain multitudes and fill a need People were tired of stepping in it, tracking it in the house, provoking endless contortionist sniffing of shoe bottoms. I can't keep this up. People think I don't even exist. It's all magic and evaporating bags, not endless hours of revolting work following, following my nose to fetid treasures. I dream of promotion, a new lease of, on immortality, queen of unexamined consequences, shutting off the diesels, idling, 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 taking down yard sale signs and lost kitten flyers during utility pole cleanup, returning abandoned animals to owners as fairy of the fair. I could help enlighten future gods suck industrial poison from soil, sieve plastic from oceans, filter the air itself and rocket contamination into space. But for now, small things with a big presence. Those bags make everyone feel good. Self-righteous owners, other trail users, Gratified that they're sharing the trail with such heroes, even me. If someone hadn't invented them, I'd still be picking up smokers and visible filters. The bags make money and spread happiness, so they'll be with us for a long time. Chances are your bag and its prize will rot before I get to it, but don't worry, someone else will take care of it. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Thanks for reading. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, you may have noticed there are some surveys sitting around on your chairs. So we hope that you will fill those out and then leave them on the back counter before you leave because that just proves you know how many people are attending the events and then we can continue to get funding from um, 
the Utah Humanities Council for these wonderful events. Okay. Um, okay, so now we get to introduce William Trowbridge. He served as the Poet Laureate of the State of Missouri from 2012 to 2016. He has six full poetry collections. His poems have appeared in more than 30 anthologies and textbooks, as well as in such periodicals as Poetry, The Gettysburg Review, Crazy Horse, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, and Prairie Schooner, among many others. His awards include an Academy of American Poets Prize, a Pushcart Prize, a Breadloaf Writers Conference Scholarship, a Camber Press Poetry Chapbook Award, and fellowships from the McDowell Colony, Ragdale, Yaddo, and Anderson Center. He is a distinguished university professor emeritus at Northwest Missouri State University, where he was the editor of the Laurel Review, Green Tower Press from 1986 to 2004. He lives in uh, Lee's Summit, Missouri, and he teaches for the University of Nebraska Low Residency MFA in Writing Program, which is where I met him in 2005, and he is my mentor, and I'm so excited to have him here tonight to read for you. Um, so thank you for everyone coming, and welcome to Bill. Well, thank you, Star and Helicon 9, and uh, all of you who came tonight. What a nice looking crowd you are. Um, and thank you as always, Shannon. Um, I'm going to start out with some poems from a uh, from right now, the world's only graphic poetry chapbook. Um, I was I was kind of um, interested in superheroes a while ago, and uh, seeing how they were popping up all over the place in video games and TV and books and films and all of that. And I did notice that there was a there's something missing in the in the superheroes universe, and that is an old superhero. <laughs> so. Um, I, um, I thought about this character called Old Guy Superhero, and my publisher was, was nice enough uh, to, um, to publish this as a comic book, um, and actually hired a printer that does only comic books, so it would look exactly like a comic book. And so the poems are here, and I got a, a wonderful illustrator, um, Tim Mayer. Uh, here's a, here's a close-up of old guy and his glory, and uh, there's also something that one of my favorite illustrations that Tim did. This is old guy with one of his chief weapons, the denture grapple. Uh, to see how he can, you know, catch his villains with that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read a couple of poems from uh, that, and then go on to other things. Um, so this first poem is called, as you might guess, Old Guy Superhero. Old Guy Superhero feels like a young guy in a bad costume. The arms and legs sag and the waist too tight. But there should be a large S, golden star, or lightning bolt. There's what looks like a zero, and on his trunks depends. The boots look more like flannel slippers. Some louts made off with his super hearing and x-ray vision, leaving only an ampli ear and Coke bottle lenses. Like certain sheep, he doesn't fly so much as plummet. He has a smash through a good door or wall since before he can remember, which is a little after breakfast. <laughs> Speeding bullets and tall buildings must now be turtles and molehills. He has no fear of an erection lasting more than four hours. <laughs> but he's depressed and often flatulent. His best tactic, the long wait, accounts for the demise of many a foe. That, or rambling on, and on, and on, and on, which can paralyze from as far as 10 feet. He's not handsome like Clark Kent, or rich like Bruce Wayne, but in the prolonged run, 
he can be a deadly opponent if he doesn't mix you up with somebody else. <laughs> Old guy, superhero, counter-terrorist. Old guy's in line for his social security check. When a man enters carrying a gun and wearing a suicide vest, so people start to scream. Old guy continues dog paddling through the shallows of his memory till the terrorist, noticing his scarlet cape and blank expression, shoves the gun to his forehead and asks how it feels to face certain death. Same as usual, says old guy, <laughs> mistaking the threat for a rare show of interest. <laughs> which prompts him to dust off his five examples of why everything's gone to goddamn hell <laughs> since Truman fired Custer. <laughs> After a while, the terrorist's eyelids droop, and he slumps into a nearby chair, snoring. When the gun drops to the floor, old guy politely retrieves it, just as the SWAT team bursts in. How did you do it, old guy? asked the press. Blue what, he says. <laughs> so one last one. This is old guy. All superheroes have to have a nemesis, you know, an arch enemy. And of course, old guy's nemesis is death. Um, so this is old guy versus his nemesis, uh, part two. Um, my, my version of death is based on uh, Ingemar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. If you're a movie fan, you've seen that death. The, the big conflict in that movie is death and, and a knight play a chess game to see whether death will take the knight or the knight will win and be able to stay alive again. So, old guy versus his nemesis. Old guy wakes up from a noonday snooze to find death once more setting up his chess set, offering old guy the choice of white or black. Black, mother's old guy. Revealing choice, grins death, means you've been depressed, as well you should be. Reeling off a list of famous suicides, Socrates, Cleopatra, Dudu Topaz, death says he'd like to join the club if he didn't have to be death. He explains committing suicide would be like kissing himself on the forehead. Impossible, though it would be a breeze for old guy, who says he couldn't kiss himself that way either. No, says Death, I meant breeze to kill yourself. He adds, there's a banquet of methods, many of them, not all that painful or messy. Why don't you try shooting yourself in the forehead, old guy suggests. Death counters that death is an on, that death is an on, death death is an ontological impossibility. That kissing the, the kissing thing was just a metaphor. How would you do it with a semaphore? Old guy asks. <laughs> I said metaphor. Snaps death. Maybe if you sharpen it, he says. No, no, <laughs> shouts death. Metaphor, metaphor. Old guy continues. That'd make quite a mess, what with the flag jamming things up. <laughs> Death declares he didn't come all this way to talk about his goddamn suicide. <laughs> he didn't ask for this job anyway, where everybody hates you and you go, all you do is go around creeping people out and causing misery for no reason whatsoever. I could have been a dancer, he says. <laughs> if you'd like to know, he sobs. But dance with death, right? Get an agent with that hanging around your neck. He rakes the chess board into the bag, folds up, fold, rakes the chess pieces into a bag, folds up the board and clatters off. How about trying one of them plastic bags over your head, says old guy. <laughs> um, I'm you're familiar with the tilter walk, tilt a whirl, one of the most evil devices ever contrived in human beings. So. Um, yeah. A very nasty thing, which I, which, which uh, I still carry scars in my childhood, trying to conquer the tilt of world, getting through without throwing up, and I never made it. Um, and I, I read a while ago that, um, that the motion of the tilt of world 
is comparable to what the physicists are talking about when they when they talk about chaos theory. You know, butterfly <laughs> wing causes a storm in South America. Tilt a whirl. It speeds you in a circle on a wavy platform. At the same time, whips you around inside that circle, wheel within a wheel, to quote Ezekiel. Each year, I try to master its gyrations, only to regurgitate with my corn dog and cherry coke, my youthful self-assurance. This dated wry contraption I now read can be a model for chaos theory. The spins of that inner circle, erratic as the bully, summoned by some butterfly wing to beat me up three days in a row on my way home from school. Yes, he smirked when I asked why. I thought he was a nice man, said Killer Perry Smith, right up to the minute I cut his throat. In Italy, a guy was killed by a pig falling from a balcony two stories up. Neighbors dined on free ham afterwards. Some zealot plugs an Austrian archduke, and the world heaves up eight million corpses. Hang on tight, the attendant says, as we brace for gravity's blind side. Um, I subscribe to a magazine called British Heritage, and, and um, uh, my latest issue came with this um, amazing, stunning, disturbing photo of um, um, the, um, the shot at dawn memorial for soldiers who were, who were executed for various violations of their duty during World War I. And they were, they were uh, in 2006, finally, all pardoned because of the arbitrary nature of those um, killings. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a memorial to them with a statue 10 feet high of, of uh, one Herbert Burden, who was 17 years old and who was shot at dawn for uh, leaving his post. Um, along with uh, a lot of other people. So um, the title of this is Dulcia Decorum, and you may recognize that because I stole it from Wilfred Owen uh, in his great poem. Uh, he was a soldier in World War I and wrote an amazing poem with that title. Uh, so at any rate, the, the, the statue is, is this amazing. You, should, you can Google it, I, have, I suggest you do. Google uh, Shot at Dawn Memorial, and you will see this statue of this boy and he really looks like a 17-year-old kid staying there with the, with the target on his heart where the firing squad is supposed to shoot, uh, blindfolded, hands behind his back. Um, yeah, anyway, so here's the poem, Dulcia Decorum. There he stands, bigger than he could have been in life. Private Herbert Burden, Northumberland Fusiliers, who lied about his age to join in the Great War, shot for desertion at 17 to keep the others fighting, blindfolded, hands bound, schoolboy mop untrimmed, winter coat open, heart marked with a disc. Rendered in gray stone, he stands before 300 wooden posts that stand for the others, privates, almost all, who shared his fall guy luck among the 3,000 whose sentences were never carried out, pardoned with the others in 2006. He stands up straight and still the way they taught him, holding his stone breath. Uh, I read a very interesting book quite a while ago called uh, The Arctic Grail about um, uh, an expedition of the British Navy to find the, um, uh, the Northwest Passage from in, in the Arctic uh, Circle to try to shortcut the voyage from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, nobody knew how to get through it, so they kept sending people out and they kept dying. And one of the main reasons they, they kept dying, uh, the British Navy especially, uh, which was the, which was the the spearhead of colonization. You know, the British Navy was the first people who arrived, and then your ass was grass. You know, after that, if you were a native. Uh, but um, because of that, 
the worst sin in the British Navy, in the, in, the, in the colonizing arm of the British Navy, was to do what was called going native, which is, you know, you're supposed to change them into us, not let them turn, turn you into them. Uh, if, you, if you know anything about mutiny on the bounty, remember, you know, they got to Tahiti and all the sailors went native. And uh, what a horror, though, in the basement. And so the, the weird part of it was that, the, so the rule of thumb, uh, idiotically, was that uh, the way to keep from going native is don't ever do anything, wear anything, act like anything that the natives do. So when you're in the Arctic area, uh, not doing anything that the natives do means you're going to freeze your ass uh, because you know they know how to survive and you don't. So uh, that's what this poem is about. Uh, in that voyage, Sir John Franklin with a crew of 124 embarked to find a Northwest Passage and they all died um, um, along the way. And Sir John Franklin nevertheless was declared a hero of the British Empire because he had that stiff upper lip. You know? British love that, even though you die horribly. <laughs> White out, this is called. For fear of succumbing to the ways of savages, the officers eschewed blubber for tinned meat that leaked lead from the seams, refused parkas, choosing flannel coats that got soaked and then froze. They turned their backs on dog sleds and igloos, which also stank of going native. Something their store of Bibles, novels, carpet slippers, silverware, and button polishers assuredly did not. Finally, in place of blubber, protection from the scurvy that racked their bones, the still living snow blind and starving, their ship bound fast in Arctic ice, gallantly ate the dead till the last survivor froze. So much for the British Empire. <laughs> uh, my father was a, was a uh, combat soldier in World War II and um, uh, one, one evening when I was a kid, he took, to a, took me to a movie called Battleground, which is uh, an old war movie, World War II maybe, about, uh, the, centered around the battle, what was called the Battle of the Balls in Germany. It was, a, it was a horrible battle in the dead of winter. And after the, after the movie, he began to have flashbacks and got, got very kind of scary. So um, this movie is called Battle, this, this uh, poem is called Battleground. It showed the war, as my father said, boredom flanked by terror, a matter of keeping low and not freezing. You wore your helmet square, he said, not at some stupid angle like that draft dodger Wayne who died so photogenically in the sands of Iwo Jima. Those nights I heard shouts in the dark from my parents' room. He was back down in his foxhole, barking orders, taking the fire that followed him from France and Germany, then slipped into the house where it hunkered in the rafters and thrived on ambush. We kept our helmets on, my mother and I, but there was no cover, and our helmets always tilted. He'd lump us with the ones he called John Doe's, lazy, stupid, useless. We needed to straighten up and fly right, pick it up, chop chop, not get nervous in the service. We ducked down like GIs with German snipe where German snipers might be crouched in haylofts, their breath held for the clean shot. Bang, my father said. The dead went down, some like dying swans, some like puppets with their strings cut. I wanted to hear more, but he changed the subject. Talk about the pennant, the cards, shaky odds. How unusual was worth the whole John Doe lot of them. Um, I had a little pet 
dog for about uh, six hours one time when I was a kid. Uh, it was a stray dog that followed me home, and I thought, well, you know, like any kid, you know, it follows me home, the dog likes me, and then I'll have a doggy if it comes in, you know, feed it, and it'll all be wonderful. It didn't turn out very well, so that's what this poem's about, which still haunts me. Well, obedience. The ghost of it whimpered back last night from a wet November 50 years ago. A scraggly cocker that shadowed me home from school, and when I let it in, Ignored a meal to snuffle crotches and hump legs as if to win us with what it knew of love. Its sad pink dick unsheathed like a gut protruding from a wound. Its roomy eyes spinning with dread. Its odor of mushroom and shit making itself at home in our carpet. No, bad dog. Down, we said, shoving it away, till my father got it in the car, and we drove off through the dark to a cornfield outside town where the rain blew, and it slumped off right away, going to get lost like a good dog. Uh, um, let me see. We have time for a couple more, I think. Um, my father was um, not good with tools. He was good with a lot of other things, but, but put a saw or hammer in his hand and disaster was right around the corner. Um, so this poem is called Mr. Fix-It in a kind of sarcastic way um, about my father's problem. There's a, an allusion to uh, Laocoon. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a Greek character from Greek myth who was uh, visited uh, with a plague of serpents by the gods and there's a famous statue called Laocoon where he's, he is there and he's wrapped around with these giant anaconda sized serpents and his children are beside him wrapped around with child sized serpents, serpents you know, they want the whole family waxed. Um, and there's a reference also to a character named Blind Pew who was from Treasure Island. He was the blind guy in Treasure Island. Mr. Fixit. Cursed by the Brogan gods who govern tools. My father turned Laocoon with power cords and garden hoses, blind pew with drills and hammers. Screws talked back, nails went rubbery, saws turned piranha. He swept, fumble, curse his way through the gauntlet of directions, jamming a half-inch bolt in the hole for a quarter inch dowel, joining tab A to extension N, skipping the ambiguous step 5A. <laughs> God damn it, he declared to the unresponsive skies. Lousy son of a bitch, he'd say for our electric mower, whose cord he'd sever every other turn. A combat vet with two bronze stars, he soldiered on till the day he bought the canister of Grobright, advertised to turn your lawn lush as the greens at Pebble Beach. An IED in his uncertain grip, it worked by pumping air to force the liquid through the nozzle. He took the contents of the face the metal lid grazing an ear. There was no talk at dinner. <laughs> Only the AC chuckling under the window. <laughs> uh, I'm going to end up with a poem about um, a, a, a rant poem. I like to write rant poems. Everyone's going to get pissed off and just want to rant and let go. Poems are really good for that. And, and, uh, one of, my, one of my rant targets is meetings. I hate meetings of any kind. Uh, and, and, and even there, there are important things. I get attention deficit problems, you know. I might as well be retarded. I just, you know, I just shut off. And, you know, if somebody asked me something, I'd be like the kid in the back row. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Uh, so this is my rant poem about meetings. Um, called committee meeting. A beating with nettle-coated noodles 
mind entreating fight or stealthy fleeing the depleting kit and dull caboodle. I doodle cartoon faces and bouquets of loopy squiggles as time drags along excreting mustard gas. Is this the wills unseating as seeming centuries creep by like slugs retreating over salt? Is there no halt to this brow beating where hot air keeps competing with itself for front row seating, demeeting issues down to bare bone blather, meeting out ennui as pores keep leaking in this overheating of the stomach's juices that makes us strain to keep our bowels from blowing bubbles, oh toil and trouble, while buffs redouble notions they won't even start completing and pain comes full back cleaning up our spines in this Lilliputian strudel repeating and repeating eating up the years till flying sheep send down their bleedings and chickadees go moo instead of tweeting. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question and answer sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for questions and answers. Yeah, questions and answers. Yeah. We only have time for questions. No answers. <laughs> no answers. <laughs> we have no answers. Um, does anybody have any questions for Bill? Nobody wants to be on the spot. Eh? <laughs> yes. Um, What's the ratio between things you write that you like versus things that you write that you throw right in the garbage? Uh, boy, that's a hard one because they're, they're uh, you know, it's a very erratic process. Um, so uh, I've never really, really, you know, uh, calculated a ratio, but um, I don't think I throw a lot of stuff in the garbage anymore, but I do. Um, throw it in the desk drawer for a while if it's not working and come back to it. Uh, one thing I've learned from writing a lot of years is that um, something that doesn't seem to be working, excuse me, phone call here that I'm not going to answer, go away. Um, um, a poem that doesn't seem to be working when you're toiling away um, at it if you put it away for a while uh, and come back to it, sometimes with a sort of fresh angle, suddenly it'll open up for you. And, and uh, so I would I would caution you against unless you did have something that just completely sucks, uh, which you know that's that's pretty obvious. Usually, um, one of my one of my greatest poems that sucks. Uh, I wrote when I was in college. I came home incredibly drunk. And, and, and uh, decided that I, I was inspired and, and could write the greatest poem that ever was written and, and scrawled it down before I collapsed into bed and got up in the morning uh, remembering that I'd written this great poem and it was perky and everything, didn't even have any coffee and I ran to the desk and, and thought, my God, what is, what is this? <laughs> so, yeah. Watch out for that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but again, don't don't lose faith too fast in a poem that doesn't seem to be cooperating at the time, because uh, sometimes you'll you'll be surprised. And um, it's always it's always good, I think, to surprise yourself in a poem. Robert Frost, I think, said, you know, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And if there's no for a surprise for the reader, the reader is going to get bored. Uh, and I, you know, one of the, you know, the, one of the great experiences, I think, in writing any kind of you know fiction or poetry or whatever, is when when the story or the poem starts to take itself in a direction that you weren't even planning. Uh, I always tell my students to start, you know, listen to what the poem, where the poem's going to go. You may have had an idea what this poem was going to be about and how you're going to end it, and the poem seems to not want to go that way. Seems to want to go another way, and it's almost always best to follow the poem. You know, sending you little signals about what it wants to be, and, and uh, um, you get that surprise. You know, I wasn't really expecting that, but here it goes, and it seems to be a lot more interesting than what I had in mind when I started out. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I, um, I hang on to my poems pretty long before I completely trash them. Anybody else? There's going to be a quiz after. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, it was a pleasure, and you were a great hip crowd, so uh, it was good to read with you, and, uh, and um, take care. We've got books in the back for sale that we that Bill can sell you and sign books for you if you want. And we'll move in now to the rest of our open mic readers. Um, next we'll have Nathan Allen, Brittany Allen, Sarah Timmerman. Hi, I'm Nathan, and I love being the first person to read after the real writers. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to read two if I end up having time. I think I will. The first one is kind of in spirit of the season. It's called The Wire Beast. Dusk and damp outside the cracked foundation of a basement apartment of a poor man's complex. Sunset horizons with red beams of gory flame cutting through the gray dismal cotton balls of farmer's prayer, growing darker and more silent. Upon a telephone wire, off the old wooden mast sloppily set in the corner of the parking lot, rests the ethereal shadow of a great ape, ten feet tall, broad as a car, holes for sockets and winter for eyes. It looks at me, or through me, if there's a difference. Crawling gracefully, perfectly balanced, upon the narrow wire toward me. The wire beast walks behind apartment number four, B4, staring at me still through layers of brick and chill. I clumsy my way through the yellow brick corner, needing to keep my eyes on the monstrous form to find nothing except a rustle of breeze, tossed leaves. I knew it wasn't real, I tell myself. It's a waking dream, a shadow beast. And I know it for certain when I turn around and see it lurking next to the building some 30 feet behind me, but it's striking, close enough to recognize its hair swirling unnaturally with and against the breeze. I'm beckoned and resist, trying to convince myself to cover my eyes and look away, but can't quickly enough to avoid seeing my own arms covered in seizing spiders, twisting and shaking. That can't be real, they can't be but I can't brush them off, and I feel them bite me as I try and pick them off individually. I'm filled with a sterile calm and unhelpful stillness that people call shock as I stare into the hollow sockets that stare back. I step backwards toward my door and escape from this false world, but the ape reacts with jerky movements in my direction. Step backward faster toward my door to get away from this illusion. Somewhere between suddenly and in slow motion, the beast charges toward me, its eyes glowing bright black with a stature more grand than I had appreciated before, and a booming growl that sounds of earth breaking and iron boiling. My heart freezes, and I'm no longer in shock. I'm horrified. I'm going to die here. My heel catches the top edge of a cement block and I fall as the, mon as the monster reaches me. The cold grass and dirt bounce my head toward the sky and my feet hold back the hairy beast that as I look at it, vanishes. Uh, the second one I'm going to read is called Grief Robbers. <clears throat> I sound like sex, bad sex. Heavy, anxious breathing and predictable beats on muggy concrete. Thump. Through thick, wet air. It's irregular, this weather. Clouds are frozen in outer space. They're so far away and painted. It's irregular. I feel so far away from the sky. Heavy, the walk I stroll through wavy lines I force between cars and strangers upstairs and fumbling with a key card. I smell blood. It's irregular. The apartment is as empty as I had left it, with the same bottle of bleach on the table, and the same phone still full of contacts and ignored messages, and the same half-empty fifth of Belvedere. I drink some, some might say wasted, before I kill myself. Isn't that what good liquor's for? In the bathroom, no need for bloodstains, insurance, bleach and pills. Bleach took a few tries. I'm not sure how much I got to stay down, but I've always been good at pills. The timid stream of blood rolls down my forearm and kisses the fake porcelain. Too drunk and high to cut effectively. Good thing I'm good at pills. 
head floating up while flesh sinks toward the dirt, screaming, I think. I hear screaming, but it's far away, fading. Blue light and red shadows swirl through the naked window as my two roommates stare at me. I'm hauled away on a gurney, almost certain to survive. Maybe the nice liquor was wasted. God knows I didn't enjoy it. I never want to see them that saved me again. They robbed me of their grieving from losing me, the only pity I had left. They chose resentment. Now they lose me, but they get to feel guiltless and annoyed, maybe even like saviors. Good for them. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the master class taught in the library this afternoon. Um, and we um, got to hear about meter. And I remember this one line that you mentioned about how trochees don't make very good poems. Um, and so I found a poem I wrote called Baby Trochee. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey. <laughs> Baby, trochee, growth, aggress, fetus, fuck, invest, caress, dick, Mother, partner, shit, needles, money, rip, pregnant, panic, sick, partners, fathers, thick, mother, body, bit, fingers, baby, abort. Um, and the other poem I brought with me tonight is titled Soap. He brought it to me out of fear a tiny hotel soap to wash the taste of another man from my palms, replacing the sparks in my eyes with bubbles he picked up for free, begging me to take a bite and bleach the bruises on my cheeks so that he could go to bed with me and call me clean. Thank you. So I'm currently working on a poetry sequence that functions um, almost like a dictionary. So it has a word and then it is contained into sections. Um, and with the poetry sequence I'm trying to explore mental health issues and stuff like that. So this is just a couple of the poems from there that I've been working on. Uh, the first one is called Screw, Noun. One, copper pollen clings to my skin, come taste my usefulness. Drifting from one bed to another, I relate to different forms of being. I mean fucking. You're eating an egg I poached. Yellow runs along your teeth. The sink is full of dishes. I sketch this still, still life like it's an imaginative study in my own degradation. I stop only when my fingertips ache, covered in a filthy charcoal that smells of rotted fruit. Two. On earth, thin, hair-like roots, dirt clings to my nails. The river threads Highway 89 for the fifth time. My window is down, and the smell of sage rips through the car. In your dream, we were egrets. You split me open, peeled me in two with your thumbs. Like pomegranate, I resisted, but burst when you made me. I didn't have a face, but I blossomed rust-colored, so you knew. Three. A milkweed or butterfly catch this terrible desire in mason jars. In this version, I am short and slender, sharp pointed and smooth as metal. I pin myself to this way of being, like a raised helical thread running around my own slotted head. I use and join things together by being held tightly in place. And the next one is called Depression, noun. Feel me, when pressed, I compose. I am holding Wednesday's air thick and yolky between my legs, as your lips fill my mouth with smoked sour diesel strained in Virginia tobacco. My mind separates and takes to the sky like yellow-throated sparrows. Two, 
remind me. Tie yourself round my wrists. Hold your two fingers to my head silently. Like a wooden toy gun, this way touch me. My mother used to lull me to sleep on a red metal bunk bed. She made patterns in my hazelnut hair. Three, yesterday I spoke only to myself. I wait for your reply to come. Chamomile particles drain up into Kent honey clouds. I inhale an okra scent. I long to roll along the two blue veins of my tender wrists. Four, in this edited version of a conversation, my mother once told me about her urge for smallness, like a backwards Alice without the right glass bottle, about how, how last night she slept in depth, on waking she wept. Five, inversion is our entire conversation. God, did I tell you? Everyone thinks sickness as an absence, a small blue table without its third thin leg, but you, you say, paint it thickly, Sarah. Paint it ivory with prayers. Thanks. Awesome job, all you guys. Thank you for reading. We'll have four more readers tonight. Um, so our last four will be, I'm not sure how to, is it Jeff LeBan? LeBeau. LeBeau, okay. I just couldn't, couldn't quite read it. Okay, Jeff LeBeau, Chad Van Zetten, Ron Jensen, Russ Wynn. It's fine. I can't write news very distinctly. So I'm going to read two poems because um, there's really only two things I really think much about. And sadly, those were pain and my son. So the first one's about pain, or about my son actually, because it's one that's open. And it's called To My Son. Flit freely across the land, from town to dale, from wave to peak. Dance among clouds as they cast their shadows. Speak with stars upon their heavenly thrones. For tomorrow you will be faced with two plus two. The one oxygen and two hydrogen form a water molecule. You will learn how far it is to the moon. That once you there, you will be unable to breathe. Befriend the dragon and slay the wicked prince. Help the villain and question the hero's right to rule. Sign your name in crayons, a new color for each letter. Draw a tutu on your dad and a tie upon your mom. Soon enough, the weight of car failure will tip the scales, as the fear of debt will choke out time idly spent. And the second one's about pain. Um, sadly, it's kind of a constant in my life, and so frequently I write oddly romantic poems about pain. Um, this one, maybe not as much as some, uh, but it's called Pain is a Road. If I could travel it as a road, I would drive miles of twisted turns, following the middle line of Logan Canyon, traveling much faster than I should. I would stop at overlooks looks on peaks where the road below was traversed in another life. I would follow lanes curving through fog-filled valleys, heading to sunrise or away from sunset. After pothole-infested roads, I would stop at small roadside cafes with pie warm and sweet and coffee dark. I would idle in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for hours, like a California freeway with no end in sight. I would stop at inns on beaches, to sleep to the sound of waves against beach, to walk in cool wet sand returning to the road before the next guest arrives for the room. I would drive over bridges where life falls away, where cascading water echoes distantly. I would stay in my lane by keeping the cliff just outside the window, rocks waiting below, the road so worn in places that no lanes remain. I would drive where the shoulder is indistinct as it blends into rocky and sand and desert sage. I would drive on roads through forests where the next clearing might hold a town nestled against the pines or a deer. Hi. 
Um, <clears throat> I have two poems. And one of them, I haven't seen, I, don't, I can't even remember the last time I saw uh, Russ Wynn here, but one of the poems uh, has some lines that, are, that were actually inspired by uh, Russ Wynn. Uh, he and I and a bunch of other guys are in a Facebook group where we argue about which movie is better, or <laughs> which band is better, and stuff. And um, when I first got in, into it, it was really, really active. I think I kind of ruined it, actually. But it was really, we'd have these vicious conversations, these vicious debates about stuff. And I always noticed that Russ Wynn would respond to the, in these debates in, in bursts. He'd like, there'd be like 10 responses from him in, in the course of like five or six minutes, and then nothing. And then three or four hours later, you know, five or six more. And, I, and he confessed to me once that he, at the time, he worked at Conservus. And he couldn't, he wasn't free to text at any time, you know, get on his phone at any time or, or get on his computer to get on Facebook or whatever. So he'd go to the bathroom and pull up in a stall. And he'd, and then he'd go back. And, uh, and I worked that. I just, and, and they were brilliant, you know. He'd, he'd have these brilliant responses, you know, funny, funny, brilliant, you know, edgy responses. And I just pictured him, you know, with his legs drawn up onto the toilets and, you know, the con service guard patrol is coming through, you know, okay, it's not in here. Um, but uh, so I have, uh, I have a poem that's partially inspired by Russ Wynn. It's called How to Have a Job. <laughs> Find an old cinder block building out in the industrial park. It's not handsome on the outside, and it's not any better inside, and it's not actually old. It just makes you feel that way. Find the building, go in the building, stay in the building. The people in the building will grow more contemptible to you with each passing year. Be careful. The opposite is also true. It's best you know the lock on the West West Room is not trustworthy whatsoever. Test it. Just make sure you jiggle it before you sit down to send a bunch of texts. <laughs> Next, go to your office and type a big page of text, then type another, and then delete it, because someone in some other office doesn't like it. Do that a couple more times. Stay in your office until it's dark, then you can leave. It's best you know that when you go, probably no one will know. Next one isn't such a downer. <laughs> um, where is it? This is called the windshield heart. Not at all. Inspired by Russ Wynn. <laughs> Raindrops on the windshield glow with the glare of the street lamps and passing brake lights. You're taking a girl home, but you don't know exactly how she feels about you. You drive along small talking as the rain on the window glares and then dims with each passing car. The inside of the glass fogs over because the defroster isn't hot yet, so you wipe it with your sleeve. She extends her finger and draws a heart in the film of, the con of condensation beneath the rear view mirror. The window fog clears as you reach her house. She goes inside without explaining anything. She would never be so obvious but her windshield heart reappears for you every time it's cold and every time it rains. Thanks. Halloween, we can have some fun. Put on. 
Pana Cartons and go from door to door, saying, Take a treat, you can candy go over, then eat a treat, to a hot skin tent, and get back home. At least it's not in town. And what fun will have when they go out tonight? Right now, now, right now, it's school work, and giving us a fight. Thank you. Sadly, I don't have a response poem for Chad. So I figured I'd mention Chad's name so that you could form a loose association. Uh, my first poem is a, it's about bull castration. <laughs> well, that's the standing stop. In his panic, the bull seemed somehow to trust me as I brought the head bale down around his neck, linked us, he in iron, and I hanging all my weight on the gate lever. In the grass below, the dandelion slumped like surgeon's knots in a quilt. A few leaves, sink foil and sorrel, bending low to the animal's kicks. Dad knelt in the dust like someone meaning to pray and flicked a knife like light off a windshield between haunches, leaned into a spray of blood and urine, reaching. The bull stiffened and reared his head, trapped, and wailed as a flock of sparrows left for new trees. Beyond, the highway shone blue-black with radiant heat, the sun high and dangerous, and toward it all the animal heaved and blew spittle. I met his eye as he rolled it up, the whiteness saying, I cannot run anymore, and I just felt heavy. In his rage, he could no more understand than I could explain. I have, I'm an only child, um, and I almost had a sister, so this is about her. It's called Amanda. Amanda was my sister for 13 seconds. An x-ray of a sagging heart showed uterine septum, starved before anyone knew. Mother placed her in the earth alone. She traded her life for therapy and diets and self-help books and babysitters for me and Percocet for her and a breakdown and a full-time factory job while taking care of grandma, who pissed in a parking lot just to embarrass her. Willow the cat smothered her kittens in the bedroom and mom scooped them into a plastic bag, meeting my eye over the crinkle. Sometimes kittens just don't seem right to mamas, she said. Later, mother laid hydrangeas on Amanda's grave. While in the new grass, I gripped a kite by its spreader, threw it in a hard arc at the sky. It yawed stiffly and thumped into the earth. She took the reel from me softly, held yellow plastic bridle in spring wind, walked into the current, string trailing, the kite easing higher and higher, on a rippling breeze. She looked out at the field and the kite, her eyes moving across vanishing points, distant lines. The farther the string goes, the easier it will become. Um, my wife and I have been married for almost 13 years now. And when we were first married, I wrote a poem for her. And it was terrible. <laughs> and she loved it. And she had it framed. And it's in my house. And I see it all the time, and I sort of hate it. <laughs> um, but it was a gift, and I can't get rid of it, and so I thought, oh, well, I'll try again. And maybe I can get something new up there. And, and this is what came out. I don't, I don't know how that worked, but it's called tchotchke. A tchotchke is a, a keepsake that really doesn't have much of a use. It's just ornamental. She fills the house with blue china plates from other centuries and fossils dug from estate sales. I fill it with comics and a chrono.tv. TV. She hangs an embroidered coat of arms and a wall after wall of oil paintings, shadow boxes. I hang Batman memorabilia. <laughs> Her fridge has the grape juice we made together and allium bulbs stored for the next season. Mine has Diet Coke. Our medicine cabinet has pills for diabetes and high blood pressure. Our dogs are either expensive Yorkies or rescues. She's in her classroom meeting with parents and writing grants. I'm in mine, lecturing on Rogerian argument, thinking about this poem, then up late drinking with the dogs while she sleeps off low blood sugars. In the dark, I listen to her spoon chimes hidden in trees throughout the yard. Pendulums. Thanks. OK, let's give everybody else one more round of applause. Um, Star is the next helicon. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Do we know? Do we remember? Yes, it's the first week in November. Is that the seventh? The first week? Yes. Okay. The first week in November. The eighth. The eighth. November eighth. And it's Jennifer. It's the second Thursday of November. It's the second Thursday of November. It's coming up. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, so come on back for our next Helicon West. Thanks so much for coming. If you filled out your, um, and please do fill out your evaluation and leave it on the back. And if you can help us set the uh, chairs up back, st stack to the side. And thanks again, everybody, for coming tonight. Books in the back. Thank you. Thank you.